The question, how does one man assert power over another? By making him suffer. Exactly. Obedience is not enough. Power is inflicting pain and humiliation, otherwise you cannot be sure. Power is tearing human minds apart and putting them together again in new shapes of your own choosing. Power is not a means, it is an end. In our world, there will only be triumph and self-abasement. Everything else we shall destroy. The past is forbidden. Why? Because when we can cut man from his own past, then we can cut him from his family, his children, other men. There is no loyalty except loyalty to the party. There is no love except love of Big Brother. All competing pleasures we will destroy. If you want a vision of the future, Winston, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. You will fail. Why? It's possible. Hatred and fear have no life. Why is hate less vital than love? I don't know. But somehow you will fail. Something will defeat you. Life will defeat you. We control life at all levels. We create human nature. Men are infinitely malleable. Or perhaps you return to your old idea that the proletarians will arise. Put it out of your mind. They're helpless animals. Humanity is the party. I don't care. In the end, they'll meet you. Sooner or later, they'll tear you to pieces. If you don't know where that clip is from, then your mind might be presently consumed by the Wetiko mind virus. The book should be scripture to any seeker today. O'Brien in the clip certainly gives the game away and shows us the eternal machinations of the Archons. Power is not the means, but the end. Or as Jung said after he met Alan Dulles, one of history's most evil men and architect of the CIA, the opposite of love is not hate, but power. For the most part, humanity has been a miserable little band of thugs stumbling from one catastrophe to the next. Our history is like the ravings of a lunatic. Chaos. These days, the Karens and Katamites in the establishment don't even need gulags or Room 101 to, as O'Brien says, employ power to tear human minds apart and put them together in new shapes. This is happening every day as our psyches are continually pierced by divide and conquer propaganda from the media. Our personas are fragmented by social media plagues and the safety in numbers community group thought fallacy. And our brains are poisoned by fake food. There is no need to ban books as few people read them. No need to cut us from the past, as more and more think history either started when Trump was elected, or the pandemic started. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. In the old USSR, there weren't enough resources or secret police to enforce Stalinism. So the party simply brainwashed the Russian population to snitch on each other. Today, O'Brien would be proud as legions of online Stasi and neighborhood Gestapo do the bidding of the surveillance forces. Are we the baddies? Oh yes. O'Brien would be proud and impressed at the totalitarian world that disguises itself so well as enlightened republics. Bravo, Yaldi Baldi. 
Your animal farm is docile and eager to be consumed. Bravo. Humans fancy that there's something special about the way we perceive the world, and yet we live in loops as tight and as closed as the hosts do. Seldom questioning our choices, content for the most part to be told what to do next. But Winston is right. Life will prevail. The greater life of the Mandeans or the Ilan Vital of the Stoics. Light will shine through the cracks of the Black Iron Prison. The time will come when we of the broken places will rise and tear Big Brother apart with our art, innovation, and civil disobedience. It's inevitable, O'Brien. It's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but life... Uh, finds a way. As Hunter Thompson said, in a closed society where everybody's guilty, the only crime is getting caught. In a world of thieves, the only final sin is stupidity. And as the Persian saying goes, evil always turns stupid. It's stupid today. Napoleon Dynamite stupid and thus life will succeed. Thompson also said, when the going gets tough, the weird turn pro. Do the chickens have large talons? One often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. We will not get caught. Where hope dies, imagination must live. We'll always be walking away from Omelas. Just as we freaks and outcasts will always be the butterfly effect that brings the chaotic, stupid system down. It's inevitable, O'Brien. Even if most haven't read 1984 or think fascism started in 2016 because Destiny or Vosh told them so. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, so you're just an asshole. Okay, then. So welcome to both your sanctuary and training ground here at the Virtual Alexandria. Welcome to Aeon Bite. Welcome to your true purpose. Welcome to the machine, my son, and the means to escape it. We're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. And that includes me, your humble host and pompadus of Gnosis, Miguel Connor. And if he is not the word of God, then God never spoke. How do we bring life and stop the archons from tearing our minds apart as soon as we reach for our phones in the morning? I have said go touch grass and let Artemis kick your ego ass. I have said to take the inner journey because, as Peter Gabriel sang in The Carpet Crawlers, you gotta get in to get out. I've said so much, and without a doubt, creating your own magic is also important to counter the magic of that wickedness in high places. As Tom Robbins wrote in Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, disbelief in magic can force a poor soul into believing in government and business. My father says that almost the whole world is asleep. Everybody you know, everybody you see, everybody you talk to. He says that only a few people are awake, and they live in a state of constant, total amazement. So what is magic, and how can we tap into it? I'm glad you asked, O'Brien and Winston and Jung and Alan Dulles. That's what you'll learn in this exciting episode. I have the honor of hosting Sarah Mastros, who will be discussing her new book, The Sorcery of Solomon. We have found the witch, might we burn, huh? Great book, and Sarah is without a doubt one of the coolest chicks I've chatted with on the show. You'll love the interview and her insights on embracing that magical life to keep your mind from being torn apart and forever living in a digital gulag and having that boot stamping on your face forever like the rest of the meat sacks. 
and Sarah's research on Solomon will give you some ball-tingling gnosis. And Harry Potter and all his wizard friends went straight to hell for practicing witchcraft. Yay! Use magic and take a walk on the wild side. Break the simulation. Enter dream time. Embrace Sophia and high-five Hermes. Let's face it, reality ain't what it used to be. The simulation is glitching, and the Archon's evil narrative is, well, very stupid these days. Come on, then. Back to creation. I mustn't waste any more time. They'll think I've lost control again and put it all down to evolution. Just look at today at our one supreme scientific community and the issue with the replication crisis. What is it? The replication crisis refers to a growing concern within the scientific community about the reliability of published research findings. Investigations have revealed that a significant number of studies cannot be replicated meaning that when other researchers attempt to reproduce the results using the same methods, they fail to get the same outcomes. This crisis has been attributed to various factors, including the publication bias towards positive results, methodological weaknesses, and statistical errors. How could you be worthy? You're all puppets. Tangled in... The crisis undermines trust in scientific findings and has prompted calls for reforms in research practices and publication standards. A study conducted by the Center for Open Science found that 50% of the 28 scientific findings failed to replicate despite massive sample sizes. In the field of psychology, one attempt to reproduce a hundred psychology studies was able to replicate only 39 of them. The best-known analysis from psychology and cancer biology found rates of around 40 and 10 percent, respectively. That's just sad and Napoleon Dynamite stupid. The idiot! Let's not even get into the trust issues and failed promises that have eroded trust in political, journalistic, and religious institutions. What's more, the secular world has failed women and will never help them. That's a fact. As Emma Goldman said, Our society forgives the criminal, but never the dreamer. The poor keep getting poor, and the middle class vanishes. We can't vote our way out of anything anymore. And Gaia continues to be raped. What's left? What can we do? Magic. Simple as that. The Gospel of Philip states that the mother of all sins is not a dreamer, but actually ignorance. The novel, 1984, states that ignorance is strength. See how the lines have been divided across history? Which way, Western man? Gnosis or the stupidity of wanting strength over others? Led us to our interview with Sarah to find our own personal magic. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear rage, triumph, and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. We shall abolish the orgasm. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. 
Don't let it happen. It depends on you. I caught you a delicious bass. You want to play me? This is the Aeon Byte interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Sarah L. Mastros to discuss her new book, The Sorcery of Solomon, a guide to the 44 planetary pentacles of the magician king. Sarah, thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Pleasure is all ours. And as I said, I I enjoyed your book. It's got it's got a little bit of everything that somebody's gonna find rewarding. But with us too, we've got the Moondog Vance. Vance, how are you doing? I'm fine. And I'm anxiously waiting on the edge of my chair to hear about Solomon's magic deeds. Plenty of those. But before we get into that, let's hear about your magic deeds, Sarah. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to uh, write this book, how you came to becoming a witch. Well, how I became a witch is sort of a complicated story. Not really complicated, but long. The way I think about it is like all little, little kids are magicians and most people just have it beat out of them by the time they're like six or seven. <laughs> yeah. And that just... That just didn't take on me. <laughs> so I don't really have a story about when I became a magician, but I do have a story about when I found out other people were witches, which I've told in many other interviews. So I'm going to try and keep it real short. Um, I in a in a book catalog. So for the young people listening, I'm going to remind you that this story is taking place in about 1988. And so the mm-hmm. Internet does not exist. And I live in like Amish country. So books are like not that. I mean, regular books, fine, but books on witchcraft, not that easy to find. No. My largely estranged grandfather sent me a gift certificate for like a mail order book catalog. And in the nonfiction section, there was witchcraft. And I knew what nonfiction meant. That meant it was real. I had always known. I always knew, but now I knew other people did. So I added a couple of books, which admittedly were pretty disappointing but i learned some things from them and that's sort of how i got started um but in terms of salamonic magic it it also sort of started with a book so when i was maybe 14 or 15 i found a book in my local library in the history section called ritual magic by em butler which is basically a history of the grimoires And the history part was interesting. I enjoy history. But what I really liked is it had lots of excerpts from these grimoires in them. And so I didn't have any complete grimoire. What I had was a variety of excerpts from different grimoires. But between all of those, I sort of like patched in the holes with some Jewish prayers and some fairy tales and some magic from like movies to create like a full system. And that's how I cut my teeth in Solomonic Magic. Oh, wow. Thank you very much for sharing that. Awesome. And uh, I guess uh, something you do deal with in your book, The Sorcery of Solomon, is who is this book for? Who is this book for, Sarah? So I sort of think of there as being like two slightly different sort of target audiences for the book. The first one is people who have a relatively, who have been like practicing magic for a while, but haven't really done much Solomonic magic at all, right? And then the other group is people who maybe don't have as much exposure to magic, but do have a lot more exposure to like Judaics, right? So Jewish practice and folklore and mysticism. But I tried really hard to, so that's sort of who I kept in mind when I was writing the book. But if you already have experience with Solomonic magic and with the Solomonic Pentacles, I still think there's a lot for those people in this book because, you know, the first third of the book maybe is sort of an on-ramp into Solomonic magic. But two thirds of the book is just a very detailed sort of technical analysis of the Mathers edition of the Planetary Pentacles. So I sort of translate out every word that's on them and talk about the geometry and really kind of like take them apart to see how they work. And my goal in that is to teach people how to make their own, right? Which I understand broadly to be the goal of most grimoires, right? I understand the word grimoire to be, it's it's etymologically related to the word grammar. And I think of it really as a textbook, 
right? That the goal of these books is to teach magic. They are not necessarily intended to continue to be followed word for word once someone has some experience, just like any other kind of textbook. Right, makes sense. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Um, also, something you address in your book, Sarah, is that of cultural appropriation it mm -hmm. seems like we're it's a reverse engineering if you would because it's usually oh, i'm leaving my abrahamic religion where should i go but this is kind of reverse isn't it <laughs> well hmm i don't know i i, I mean i'm not sure solomon I... as i was yes yeah, i was telling vance he was a polytheist so he wasn't really he was abrahamic but he was he was not <laughs> well, I think a lot of people who come up Christian have a really skewed idea about what the other so-called Abrahamic religions are like. Like there is no question that Solomon was Jewish. He's like very solidly and securely almost <laughs> archetypally Jewish. Right. But Judaism, unlike Christianity, is not a religion of orthodoxy, right? So like what you believe is really only tangentially relevant to your status as a Jew. Um, it is certainly the case that Solomon had dealings with other gods besides the God of Israel. That's not maybe as big a problem in Judaism as Christians want it to be. Yeah, that is true. I mean, uh, we do have uh, temples and what elephantine uh, Africa where the Jews were worshiping Isis obviously uh, judaism has always been a fluid uh fragmenting religion just like christianity there's never really been one judaism so uh yeah things are there's a lot of moving parts yeah miguel what about the ten commandments though that was this was post ten commandments right moses brought that down a long time ago so that's one of the big things about being you know i am the lord thy god thou shalt not have any other gods before me so yeah so i know christians really like to translate that passage that way but what it actually says is you should have no other gods before me or even between you and i yeah so they were henotheistic it's like we believe all the gods just take care of yahweh first <laughs> um, I think that's probably one way to look at it. I guess I would say more. And what I think is a relatively mainstream Jewish reading of that passage is that what that passage forbids is intercessory gods between Jews and our tribal God, right? That we, uh, how does it say in Devarim, that you don't need to send someone up to heaven to fetch these worlds mm -hmm. down for you, right? That there is an immediate, intimate, and personal relationship between the people Israel and the God of Israel. No, that makes sense. And uh, the other argument too is historical. We don't we don't hear about Moses until like the fifth century BC. So people are wondering: was he inserted as sort of this figure to, uh, you know, uh, rein in all the Jews to one God and one system? But uh, so, but again, yeah, it was a it was a very fluid religion. I mean, you have like yeah. the scene where I think it's Isaiah or or one of the prophets, and he's he's mad because Jerusalem, there the women are crying at the death of Tammuz. So even in those days, other gods were around. Sure. Also, another thing I find interesting, Sarah, but your book says uh, it could be used, as you said, for many things as an object of ecstatic magical contemplation sure could you tell the audience about that yeah i mean so by ecstatic right the greek word is like ecstasis like out of body right and so ecstatic contemplation is that kind of contemplation right that is not sort of anchored in our mundane physical experience of reality, right? It's an experience where we are like out of our body and in this space of oneness. And I mean, I think most book, really all things can be used as an object, just like you can use anything as the object of a meditation. You can also use anything as the object of like an ecstatic contemplative practice. Makes sense. Yeah. Everything's a mandala, just as everything's a theophany. Um, exactly exactly so then in the book i just give some like specific sort of um like tips for working with the book you know in terms of bibliomancy and just in sort of like 
like getting a deeper spiritual communion with the book itself. Makes sense. And I guess the uh, the $64,000 question, as the old saying or the <laughs> old trope goes, is uh, we talk before we even get into Solomon magic is what is magic? We obviously have, you know, the, the famous Crowley uh, definition, which is a good one. But of course, then we can go to, let's say, people like Tobias Churton or Gordon White, who simply say magic is co-creating with the universe. What do you tell people when they ask you, what is magic, Sarah? So I think the first thing to understand is that like English, particularly in comparison to some other religions, like we don't have a robust vocabulary for talking about magic because we spent most of the last thousand years murdering anyone who talked about <laughs> yeah. it out loud. So we don't have a great vocabulary for it. And one of the things that means is that like, just like there are, for example, many, many, I mean, off the top of my head, I could think of four or five different Hebrew words that we'd really all translate as the English word soul. Like similarly, right. like the word magic can really mean a lot of kind of different things when you get more technical about it, right? But broadly, when I say magic, I am talking about the sort of things that involve um, like an embodied person, a person in a physical body doing some physical stuff here on earth that is somehow having an effect in like the invisible world, right? And that that visible, invisible effect, right, has some kind of, then that itself has another effect in the physical world. That is to say, right, magic is something that begins and ends in sort of the visible world, but it has this sort of occluded and invisible causal chain that is acting in, we could call it the spirit world or, but I, I you know, I'm not always a big fan of like, of terms of talking about it as if it's a different world. Like it's not a different world. It's the no. same world. We humans just like only have sensory access to some parts of the world. And even in our most sort of ecstatic and sort of magical states of consciousness, there's actually still a lot of the world that's fully invisible to us. And so I think generally magic is about like behaviors in the visible world and effects in the visible world that are tied together by an invisible causal chain. But invisible doesn't mean completely non-understandable. No, that's a great definition, and I love it. And what about the term witch? I I myself, and this is talking to other witches, came up with a definition, the, the daughters of Kybel. But how would you define a witch? Um, I will say that, again, I think witch like a lot of the different words we use can mean a lot of different things in different contexts. For me, sort of like the thing that distinguishes witchcraft qua witchcraft, right, from certain other kinds of magic is that witchcraft is inherently countercultural. That like, if your surrounding culture approves of it, it's not witchcraft. Like it's an inherently, I don't want to say pejorative, but it is an inherently countercultural word. Like, no, you know, and so I will say, like, my attachment to the word witch, as opposed to, like, I certainly wouldn't deny being a magician or an occultist or a sorceress, right? But for me, like, I prefer the word witch largely for political reasons. Makes perfect sense. And okay, so now let's get to the, the main event of your book. Uh, what is Solomonic magic? Well, you know, uh, I think that in its core, Solomonic magic is just any magic that like claims to like sort of draw its power or draw its inspiration or understand it to be taught by in some sense uh the legendary magician king solomon the 10th century king of united of united israel um you know in torah i guess we would say 10th century i think were we trying to place historically a similar figure i think it would probably be more like 8th century bc yeah, for sure. Yeah, around there. Yeah, it's interesting. People in the if you're getting out of the Abrahamic dispensation, well, maybe not Islam. I think uh, his stature of a magician is straight out of the straight out of the Quran, right there. But you know, when I grew up, it was you know he was just supposed to be this wise dude, uh, and that was it. He was basically almost the the archetypal image or representation of Sophia the wisest cat and then as you start studying you're like man he really is uh he really 
uh emits or symbolizes all magic and of course he's famous in freemasonry yeah he's famous absolutely. in magic i mean i'm just gonna push back on place. one thing you said a couple sure. of times i've heard you use the word abrahamic but actually the things you're saying are only true about christianity like talmud repeatedly like yeah, talks about true. solomon as a magician yeah that is true i guess I, I yeah i don't know if i should say orthodox abraham because even in even in christianity sarah the gnostics knew about solomon there's a for example sure. he appears several places there's this place in the he appears in the the testimony of truth i'll quote it later he appears a, a couple more yep. uh passages Absolutely. Appears, so they so some christians certainly knew about him being yeah. a, a magical force yeah, absolutely. But, but I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I think understanding Solomon as a magician, the way we would use that word today, is in fact quite mainstream and orthodox in Judaism, both mm -hmm. both right. modern and historic. And when did the first legends of Solomon as a magician come about for the audience? <sighs> you know, um, I think it's complicated because, you know, it's hard to know where to draw the exact line for what is what does and doesn't constitute magic. Right. right. Because unlike witchcraft, magic isn't inherently countercultural. Like in many kinds of Christianity, magic is countercultural. But magic is like a normative practice in most cultures, including sort of the cultures we see in Torah. So there are certainly Torah stories where Solomon is engaging in behaviors that I would understand to be magic. For example, dream incubation. Right. Where you like seek out contact with spirits in your dreams. I, I would generally contextualize that story <laughs> yeah. like that as magic. And he he does that. But I mean, so do many other biblical figures engage. Right. So I think it's hard to say exactly when like the word magician starts to get applied to Solomon. Certainly, I think there is no question that by late antiquity, so maybe like 400 or 500 BCE, Solomon, like magicians are turning to Solomon for aid in magic, right? But I think that really, that that reputation really sort of like cements itself a little bit later, maybe like 200 BCE through like maybe 200 CE, I would say is when like sort of, which another way to say that would be like in sort of like, there's a kind of syncretic sorcery that is establishing itself in late antiquity in in places that speak greek right so the kinds of magic that you see reflected in say the greek magical papyri or in like amulet gems i mean solomon's all over those as a magician so his reputation as a magician there is is certainly well established it's a little hard to say when it starts right exactly yeah i wanted to quote the passage from the testimony of truth and then we can get into some of sure. the legends but it says uh and so do you happen to know when that text is from i'm, I'm not uh, very familiar with yeah Nag Hammadi mythology. library you're probably looking if it's carper second century middle okay. of the second yeah, century yeah. that's uh it, it could be a little later it could be a little earlier right. but so by then he and the author's writing some of them fall into idol worship others have demons living with them as did david the king it is he who laid the foundation of Jerusalem and his son Solomon whom we whom he fathered in adultery is the one who built Jerusalem he did it with the help of the demons because he got their power when he finished building he imprisoned the demons in the temple and put them into the seven water jugs they stayed there a long time left in the water jugs when the Romans went up to Jerusalem they discovered the water jugs and right away the demons ran out of the water jugs like people escaping from prison. The water jugs remain pure after that, and since those days, they live with people who are in ignorance and have remained on earth. So those demons could be right next to you next time you go to the store, Sarah. Sure. I hear they avoid the bottled water section for some reason. <laughs> so if you want to be safe, go to the bottled water section. But now it's interesting because, yeah, as you said, there are already legends of Solomon's ring and conquering demon, and this author gives kind of a... A yeah. different take and you can kind of tell that based on the way he tells the story it seems like he already expects his audience to be familiar with right. the idea yeah. right that solomon was engaging in sorcery that he was like having truck with spirits right because the way he says it like he says like as everybody knows solomon also <laughs> blah, blah, blah blah so like do you see what i'm saying like from yeah, that yeah. we can gather that like it's a very well established myth by that point 
Yeah, for sure. Especially in Alexandria, everything in Egypt, everything was pretty mm -hmm. much known. It was such a, a stew of the esoteric. And I love some of the legends. And one of my favorite passages there is when you talk about Asmodai or Asmodeus, mm -hmm. his sort of you call him his quote fremeni. Yeah. So they have like a it's almost like they have the odd couple roommate show if if they were in Hollywood or something. They <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly how I think about it, right? Like if you if you sort of read a there's a lot of Solomon and Ashmadai. Uh, Ashmadai is like the Hebrew name for like the Latin name would be Asmodeus, right? Um there's a lot of stories about Solomon and that figure. And like sometimes they're sort of doing business together. And sometimes they're clearly enemies and there's just like this rich and complex relationship between them. So I, I really like the word frenemy for that. I thought it was perfect. And oh, the you. other one part too, I thought, which I hadn't heard, but there's that one part where uh, Asmodeus takes his, you know, tricks him from his ring that he can control mm -hmm. demons and swallows them and then goes to the other side of the world and spits them out. And mm -hmm. Solomon is like destitute, has to like start over and then, he goes and he he becomes a cook and he cooks for some king and the king loves his food. I was hoping he'd go work at a Waffle House, but this story is <laughs> just as good, right? <laughs> I mean, every Waffle House I've ever been in was packed full of demons. So. <laughs> yes, especially at 2 a.m., yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I've, I've really never been in a Waffle House except <laughs> at 2 a.m. Hey, yeah, yeah. You don't go there. You end up there. Right? That's how it goes. So that's a great story. And then, mm -hmm. of course, the idea of Shamir, the the worm that he controls and all that. Uh, what uh, What is any other legends that you find that fascinate you or really uh, spoke to you about Solomon? I am uh, particularly a fan of stories about Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Mm. Right. So I think most people know those stories. Yeah. Um, but basically, Solomon is quite young when he comes to the throne. Right. And so for the first piece of his reign, he's sort of engaging in a lot of like infrastructure projects around Jerusalem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, per perhaps relevant. I, th I think something we don't talk about enough when we talk about Solomon is that, you know, his name means peacemaker. Mm -hmm. His name is closely related to like the word shalom, peace. Right. In Arabic, it's salam. Right. right. So in, in Hebrew, his name is Shlomo. So it's a little... Um, it's a little, you can hear a little more that the names are related. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, sometimes people say it's because, you know, um, Solomon's, David and Solomon's mother got together in like a real fucked up way. Mm -hmm. um, and God was not happy about it. Um, like the short version is that David was really into Bathsheba. Uh, but she was married to David's friend who also worked for him. Like he was a general in one of the armies and David like sent his friend on a suicide mission so that he could fuck his wife. Yeah. Well, he was actually already fucking his wife. He sent his friend on a suicide mission. So nobody would find out he got his wife pregnant, which is deeply fucked up. Yeah, but yeah. That, that child's not Solomon. So that child dies, right? Generally understood as a punishment for adultery, though. I, don't know that I would exactly read it that way. Really? Right? I, I see it as a human sacrifice. Oh. Viper, that's the way I see it. God is like, I oh. mean, that soul is mine now. Oh, interesting. I, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we weren't there. I Well, right. And I also <laughs> think, I, I say this in the book, but I feel like maybe I didn't hit this point hard enough in the book. I really believe like the if you're looking at a text and you're trying to determine like, is this a sacred slash magical text or not? Mm -hmm. Like the, the ability of a text to like simultaneously convey multiple truths to different people at different times to me is like a defining characteristic of a sacred text. Like For if sure. a text only has one correct interpretation, it's like not a no. sacred text. It's just like not how they work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, anyway, so Solomon comes later, right after David has like, the prophet Nathan has like told David, like, hey, that was uncool. You need to get your shit together. Um, and, you know, David gets his shit together. Um, and then they have another child who lives named Solomon. So they name him Peace. And so the rabbis will say that like he's named one reason he is named Peace is because David has made his peace with God. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I think, really relevant. Like 
During the rule of David, Israel was at war with basically all of its neighbors pretty much the entire time. Like David was a warrior and the nation of Israel was at war for most of David's reign, right? But Solomon is a peacemaker, right? So Solomon, under Solomon's reign, which is quite long, he comes to the throne as a David quite young, right? Um, Like Solomon makes peace with all his neighbors. He marries the daughter of Pharaoh and cements an alliance with Egypt. And so under his reign, like in this time of peace, right, when Israel is at peace with her neighbors, like that's when Israel is thriving, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's really central to the mythology of Solomon, right, that that the foundation of wisdom is making peace, right? Something that maybe... No, that makes sense. And now, yeah, tell us about the Queen of Shia, because again, the Bible is so mysterious. It's like they meet and then she just takes off and you're like, well, what happened? Yeah. We know very little about her from Torah, but there's just really, really rich mythology about her. Um, I really recommend for people who are into this story, I really recommend a book called The Demonization of the Queen of Sheba. Mm. Oh, okay. I think the author's name is David Lassiter, but before we actually like before this goes live, I'll look up that name and make sure, sure I got sure. his name right. Um, So I recommend that book if you want to sort of like learn more about this really deep and complicated mythology. But basically, I'm going to assume most people are like vaguely similar, familiar with the story, but I'm going to tell it. So, you know, as Israel rises to prominence, right, the queen of Sheba, who is the queen of this like very rich, very politically powerful land to the south, it's not entirely clear where Sheba is, nor is it entirely clear that Sheba is the name of a country. Mm, Sheba means seven, but it also means stars, like the seven planets in particular. And so Queen of Sheba, mm, particular, like Malika Shaba, right, or Malika Shaba, it can mean like the queen of stars, right? So in addition to understanding it as like the queen of this place named Sheba, there's also this implication that she's like, at least again, mythologically, right, which I think is the only reasonable way to read any Torah story, right, right? that mythologically she's like this great sort of um, star priestess, right, like she's, she's a, that, that Sheba is, is a community of star worshipers, right, and she is their queen, but also their, like, chief astrologer priestess basically right and so she hears through the grapevine i mean actually a bird tells her like a literal bird tells her um about this like magician king in the north who has taken this little backwater country of israel and really turned it into like a major player on Uh in on the regional scene right and so she wants to find out about that and so like she goes to visit right um he's still pretty young in that story she's older than he is um and she is she's the wisest woman in the world right and so they spend a lot of time together she tests him with riddles um and they like teach each other their wisdom which i certainly understand to involve um like teaching each other a lot of magic and right. also a sexual relationship torah doesn't explicitly make that clear but i think almost every folk reading of that story <laughs> it understands it that way and in particular but like she can't stay because she has to rule her kingdom far away right and he can't go with her because he has to rule his kingdom here so they have like this tryst for a while right um and she goes home pregnant right and and mythically like the royal line of ethiopia right uh originates in the child of the queen of sheba by king solomon could this be possibly in, be interpreted as Sheba being representative of the heavens themselves and Sol- Solomon was studying astrology and making predictions and prophecies based on what he saw in the stars? I mean, I'm not going to not tell you you can't interpret it that way. Like, you certainly can interpret it that way. I think that's um, uh, that would be an uncommon way to interpret it historically but i think that's a great interpretation um i will say i have this complicated personal mythology which i want to be super clear what i've said before about the queen of sheba is like deeply rooted in historic folklore not just jewish stories but muslim stories uh, arabian pagan stories like it's a very like well developed hagiography 
right? That like any mythology yeah. has variants, right? But what I'm about to say, totally my UPG, right? <laughs> yeah. That, that good. being said, I mean, like I, I'm, I'm pretty well versed in followers, not coming from nowhere, right? So, you know, Solomon's no- mother is named Batsheva, right? Now, it's important to understand that the Shiva there and the Sheba in Queen of Sheba are not spelled exactly the same, right? Like, I do want to throw that out there. But I do understand Batsheva and the Queen of Sheba. Like, I understand those words to be linguistically related, that, like, his mother is a daughter of Sheba, right? Which I understand to mean, like, one, maybe from Sheba, but I actually have this, it's like embarrassing. You know, it's always weird to like tell your personal mythology to the internet. Um, but I have, a, like, I understand Batsheva to be basically like a spy, like a witch spy mm. um, in the service of the Queen of Sheba. So not the Queen of Sheba we know about, but probably the the queen before her, because, you know, Batsheva, because just because of how old they are, right? right. And that, like, she is sent to Israel specifically to like seduce the king of Israel at that time, David, like as part of her spy yeah. mission for this like long-term strategy to like entangle the royal lines of Israel and Sheba. But again, total UPG. So like if it sings, if that story sings for you, go I with it. it. And yeah. if you don't like it, yeah. You- Parallels the uh, royalty of Europe, right? <laughs> Who did similar things to entangle themselves with each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like the the idea that like this astrologer priestess queen has these seven like, you know, sp- witch spies in her service, like one for every planet. And so Batsheva is probably the Venus one. Like she gets sent off on this Venus mission. Anyway, it's a cool story, but like I am in no way suggesting either that that is historical fact, which would be ridiculous. Um, but I'm not even suggesting that somehow like intended in the text of Torah. That's just like a story that the Queen of Sheba told me in my dreams one time, I suppose is what I will say. Well, I'm not sure if you've seen it, Vance and Sarah, and for the audience, but if you want a really cool depiction of Solomon and the mm-hmm. Queen of Sheba, watch uh, 3,000 Years of Longing, uh, directed by George Miller. Oh, yes, yeah. Mad Max George Miller. He did this uh, movie about a, a djinn, but part oh, yeah, of it is it. Queen yeah. of Sheba mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. King Solomon, and you see the romance and magic and yeah, all this I, other stuff. I love that movie. I will also say I really like the short story that it's based on, which is called The Gin uh-huh. in the Nightingale's Eye by um, A.S. Byatt, which I didn't realize the movie was based on that short story until I was like halfway through the movie. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I know this story. But the movie is honestly much better than the short story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was wondering. I was like, I wonder. It's so beautiful. You know, the short story is good, but it's short. Right. Right. Like the movie is only very tangentially. If I wasn't a big AS bias fan, I don't even think I would have noticed that the movie. (laughs) But no, I really recommend that movie so much to everybody listening. It's it's sad and beautiful and romantic, but mostly it's visually so stunning. Like I am in love with. I I watched it. And then I actually watched it again immediately. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's how much I loved that movie. It made me cry. <laughs> I'm going to check out the Solomon and Shiva queen again. So, so much material. So, right? what a power. I mean, it's at the core of the great archetype, uh, the heroes gamos or the lost love. It's got everything. Anima mm-hmm. and animus, magician exactly. and sorcerer, you know, the whole thing. So, um that's great. Um, well, what do you think, Vance? Any questions from you? As you can oh, see, yeah. Solomon has a very, very rich tradition that continues even today in our imaginations. Definitely. Um, you know, um, I was curious about um, which, which let's call them non-visible world entities, Solomon was purported to call upon in his magical endeavors and you know including building the temple i guess there was a shira and somebody else but and uh who what was the other one that starts with an a um ashmadai or asmodeus yeah right asmodeus I mean, yeah there's there's huge there's huge catalogs right of of spirits so there's a a grimoire from late antiquity called the testament of solomon and really 80 percent of that book is just a list of spirits that solomon worked with to help build the temple so honestly, like most of the demons that we would, like most of the ones in, say, the Ars Goetia 
have a have historically been understood to be demons. You know, the exact relationship of Solomon to those demons, it depends who's explaining, right? So when it's medieval Christian European warlords, right, which is like who, when we think about like medieval grimoires, that's sort of they're written by and for medieval warlords, right? (laughs) Um, Like they're definitely describing that relationship as he, as he's enslaved them, right? But I think that that's, you know, that that's also how they talk about their wives and children and literally everyone, like every other human they encounter, they also sort of act as though are their slaves. So I think that's perhaps a retrojective way to understand it, right? There's a lot of ways to understand it. So I would just say like made pact with, right? That Solomon has contracted with these demons in some way that like the exact nature of is dependent on who's doing the talking. But honestly, like I would say most named demons in Hebrew and Greek work are at some point or another understood to be um, in the Solomonic compact. Yeah, he must have um, he must have done sacrifices or done something for them if there was a contract, right? Um, if it wasn't pure slavery. What, what, what can you tell us about that? I know, I know he built the temple to Asherah, right? Um, rather than saying he built a temple to Asherah, I mean, you know, Asherah's worship was well-founded already in Israel, right? Um, and certainly he is introducing Asherah into the temple that he built. Like he he built a great temple and that temple included Asherim, I guess. Oh, so who else along the lines of my question, who else uh, was represented in Solomon's temple? Well, I think unquestionably the primary spirit with whom Solomon works is the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, okay. But who else? Who else? Mm, Got a Shira. Osmodeus got a, you know, no, a place in there? I don't think it really says that. Ashmedai would There's generally not. No, I think. Let me think about how to say this. Some say Moloch, but then Moloch could be Baal, could be Yahweh if Moloch is a title. Yeah. So then we get complicated. Uh, yeah. We don't. There's I mean, polemics against it. Like he started worshiping pagan gods, but. Uh, yeah. So, like, it's complicated because it depends who you ask, right? But I think that almost every source would agree that like every spirit with whom Solomon is working, that work is mediated by his role as by his relationship with the God of Israel. Interesting. Well, um, what do you have to say about the uh, Quran and, uh, you know, Suleiman, you know, being Solomon and all that and all the different things the Quran says about about what he did? It seems that he they go further in expounding about his magical exploits. Um, the they chin. certainly go much further than Torah does. Right. But it's also a yeah. much later text. So instead of thinking right. of them as like contemporary, we're saying that like there's this this complex cross-cultural mythology of Solomon and our oldest sources for that, that are like really identifiable as Solomon are those in Torah, right? So like the book of Kings off the top of my head, I would say probably the book of Kings is the oldest hagiography of Solomon we still have access to. Right. And that that hagiography is growing and expanding in this really cross-cultural way. And that by the time Islam is founded, Solomon's role as a magician, like that doesn't happen in the Quran that's happening, that's already happened in the mythology of Solomon, right? So as we were saying, like much earlier, right? So like in, you know, certainly by the first century CE, even by, I would say like the second century BCE, like the reputation of Solomon as a magician is sort of cemented, right? And the the Quran's hagiography of Solomon is very much in keeping with sort of the rest, like everybody else's hagiographies of Solomon contemporary with the Quran. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Uh, Last thing I wanted to ask you before, Miguel, uh, 
uh, continues with his sure. his questions is um do you think that his relationship with the do you say he married an egyptian is that correct he uh, married daughter pharaoh's the, daughter yeah yeah do you think that's where a lot of his interest in magic originally came from because the egyptians of course are notorious magicians you know there's plenty um, of egyptian magic i mean certainly he is engaging in practices that i would call magic like we talked about say dream incubation before he becomes king and well before he marries Pharaoh's daughter. So, but I mean, if the question is like, is ancient Hebrew magic similar to ancient Egyptian magic? Like, yeah, for sure. But I wouldn't say that like ancient Semitic magic is directly copying from Egyptian magic so much as like they're growing up entwined with each other. Well, how come David isn't shown uh, to do so much magic uh, compared David, to Solomon? David is famed as an exorcist, but he's a warrior, like and a musician. We can't and a forget musician, he, yeah, he but was I mean, he was like the Orpheus of those days or okay. Dionysus. Yeah, that oh, for sure. So I mean, like David, I, like I guess I, to me it feels like your question, like why am I a magician and my dad's not? Like, I don't know, different people are different. My dad had <laughs> many interests I don't share. But, I mean, David was unquestionable. Like, David has a very strong reputation as an exorcist. So the jump from exorcist to making packs with demons is like a pretty short jump. But I think I would say Solomon, even as a youngster, has this reputation of being like a super genius, right? And super wise, right? And I, I think that those are qualities we tend to associate with magicians, right? It's kind of like at least the kind of magic that we contextualize as Solomonic magic, right? Today. But it's important to remember Solomon is doing lots of magic. He is famous for his knowledge of herbal healing, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, and for talking to plants and animals, right? So like the whole spectrum of what we would call, or at least the whole spectrum of what I would think of as like witchy shit to do, like <laughs> Solomon's into all of it. But I do think that like, it is a result of him being at peace, right? I think that Solomon's focus on peace and on making peace, right, is the foundation of his wisdom. And I think it's very hard to have time to be a magician when you're constantly at war. So, I mean, that's what I would say. Yeah, for sure. I just found it weird that, you know, they're all of a sudden Solomon is on the scene and bam, all this magic happens. But before that, you know, all, all the things in the Old Testament, there, there's real, in fact, the witch of Endor, you know, it's, oh, that's bad. You know, we can't conjure ghosts. And, you know, it seems, seems like there was a, um, you know, a similar suppression of magic before Solomon in, oh. according to the Torah. I don't, I don't know that I would entirely agree with that. So like we were talking about dream incubation, Jacob famously incubates a number of dreams. Oh yeah. Well, Daniel, look at Daniel, the dreams yeah. and all that. Sure. So I mean, yeah. I guess I don't necessarily know that I would agree that like, there's no magic going on before Solomon is the yeah, thing. But I mean, Solomon it. certainly like blossoms. And I think that a lot of it has to do with, I know I keep coming back to this, like, this point of Solomon as peacemaker, but like, first of all, I think it is a like deeply and importantly relevant thing to be talking about today, like in today's world. But also I think, you know, Solomon is learning from everyone around him, right? Like he's not at war with his neighbors. He's making peace with his neighbors and like learning about them and teaching them his ways and like, you know, building up this complex network of, trade both in terms of physical goods but also in terms of like information right and i do think that historically if we look at like time periods when when magic is suddenly blossoming right so we were talking about like alexandria in late mm -hmm. antiquity i think that that we find that those are times when lots of cultures are sort of mixing together just like they are in our modern times right and i think like the modern resurgence of magic is sort of built on a similar foundation right of complex cross-cultural sort of mm, infusion sure well thanks yeah that's sure. interesting sorry i feel like i'm being really like pedantic today no no, no. I'm like oh well as you can see from history <laughs> but no, like no. well no, we're asking questions uh, sure you know uh, we, we want you to answer them yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's such a stew. Uh, it's such a stew, and much of this is uh, not very historical. I mean, for the audience, yeah, the what the uh, the Psalms are attributed to David, 
Proverbs is attributed to Solomon, but also uh, the Kohelet, the Ecclesiastes, is attributed to Solomon. That's yeah. that tells. Oh my God, he was a Stoic. He was a pre-Stoic or his attitude. And for the audience who might not know what's an Ecclesiastes, remember the famous song by the birds: "Turn, turn, turn." Quotes Ecclesiastes. You know, to every season. So Solomon is also sort of a master stoic, isn't he? A detached mystic. <laughs> Certainly, yeah, I think I think that's fair. I think that Koholet, right, which is the the name of the book that Christians call Ecclesiastes, right? Koholet, it's usually translated as either teacher or preacher, but it really in its essence means like someone who can hold the attention of the assembly of the Kohel, right? Also, interestingly, it's female. Like it's a female right, title. Yeah. Um, and like, there's a lot of speculation, mostly by men about why that is, right? But the mm-hmm. Kohelet is generally understood to be Solomon. Um, and it's generally understood to be like, like old Solomon, right? So we talked a little bit about like that story with Ashmedai where he's in exile for a while as a poor man and he has to like make his way back. And generally Kohelet is understood to be sort of based on that experience, right? So it's like this, this very, I, I will say personally, it's definitely my favorite book of Torah. I know it's weird. I don't seem like a person who has a favorite book of the Bible, but I do. And it's Colette. Um, I really recommend it to people. Um, yeah, it's definitely got kind of a stoic, well, hmm. No, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily call it stoic, but like, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, it's the closest it's, thing I could come Yeah, I mean, Kohelet is definitely a wisdom text. Mm-hmm. And unlike a lot of texts, we mentioned Proverbs before, also attributed to song. First of all, I don't think any reasonable person would suggest that like the book of Proverbs in the exact form we know it today was written by Solomon in the sense like he had a pen in no, his hand no. and wrote it down, right? <laughs> it is attributed to him. But I mean, as a magician, I take dictation from dead people quite often, actually. So like, I don't <laughs> yeah. find that, I don't find that problematic in any way to say that he wrote it. Um, Koholet, I think is, as I understand it, right? So like, I'm not a linguist, but as I understand it, linguists um, tell me that that book is almost certainly the the work almost entirely, except for the epilogue of a single author. Mm. And I think that really shows, right? I think it's even in translation, it's just a really beautiful book of wisdom and wisdom teachings. But I do think that it's a book that I maybe didn't appreciate as much when I was younger. It's kind of like some like wisdom from having been through some shit. Mm you know? And so it's a lot about how, like, I mean, it starts off that like uh, vanity of vanities, right? There's nothing new. Why do I even bother doing anything? And it really comes to this conclusion that, and this is why I would say it's not a very stoic text, right? So it's it's a emo, proto emo. Well, it starts (laughs) off that way, but the ultimate conclusion of that text is that what's good in life is to, is joy and love, right? Mm -hmm. To, to eat good things and to drink good things and to make merry and to help people and to fuck your wife and to be in love and like to find those moments of joy as you go. That's really the conclusion of that text, which is a little bit undercut by the epilogue, I will say, which almost everybody agrees is the work of a later redactor. I think when you really read it, it's shocking that that book made it into the Bible. (laughs) And I think, I think it's because especially in Hebrew, but even in translation, it it really is just beautiful. Like the, the way the words are put in order is really gorgeous, like as a piece of poetry. It's good to hear Solomon wasn't just a doomer. He had it all, even at his late age. (laughs) I think so. And then I mean, I think that's, I think, I think doominess is actually not very compatible with wisdom. Yeah, no, 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 of course not. But you, of course, you're a realist. You know oh, about sure. the temporality I mean, of life um, yeah. and things oh, go yeah. and wars start. Oh, yeah. Taxes. The world's fucking terrible and it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> yeah. And that's why perhaps now is the time for a focus on Solomon as a peacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what did Steiner say? Wisdom is crystallized pain. Oh, yeah. Know that yeah. One. I think Solomon would really appreciate that quote. <laughs> on the other hand, we have the Song of Solomon. Is that is that actually attributed to Solomon in act in fact because that's yeah. like the other yeah. direction? So the I mean it's attributed to Solomon because it begins like the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. 
But it's a little strange because Sullivan is also maybe a character in that. So the Song of Songs, I think, there are a lot of ways to read it. I think it's best read as a ritual script, right? Um, oh, I thought it was Hebrew porn. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the ritual in question is definitely sexual in nature, uh. like unquestionably. Yeah, it's it's a script for sex magic. But it is certainly deeply, deeply erotic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, very much. That would but tie I mean, into the Egyptians. They they did sex magic. And yeah, no every, problem. everybody does sex magic. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah. In those days. <laughs> no, I don't. And um, so moving to your book, Sarah. Sure. You talk about, uh, again, some of the features you bring. You talk about the SLM method, Solomon Logos Magic. I yeah. think that's a good platform for anybody who t- starts doing the rituals in your book. Tell the audience about that. Yeah. So I was saying that like the first third of the book is sort of this like on ramp to Solomon's magic. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the first piece of it is sort of what we've been talking about. Right. This hagiography of Solomon, this history of Solomonic magic, and then some instructions for like making communion with Solomon as a spirit. Um, including dream incubation, a technique I've mentioned a couple of times, right? So the SLM method, right, is just sort of this on-ramp for how to get into Solomonic magic, right? I'm in no way suggesting it's like the only method, right? But it, it rests on three pillars. The first one is that like the best spirit to get help from to learn Solomonic magic is Solomon, the magician king, right? And so I talk about his hagiography and I talk about how to contact him. Um, The next one is language, that the pentacles, that Solomonic magic broadly, but the pentacles in particular are a language-based magic, right? I'm not a huge fan. Like, I think sometimes people get really bogged down in, like, vocab and categories for magic. Uh When in practice, like, as a magician, when I'm doing piece of magic i'm almost always doing lots of kinds of magic kind of all mixed together but in order to talk about it we need some categories so i'm going to use agrippa's categories he lays out three of them the first is what he calls natural magic right which is what today we might call um like sympathetic witchcraft right so it's a magic that relies on material things right so plants and stones and animals and also like the body of the magician, right? So sympathetic magic and what we might today call like energy magic, right? A magic that you're fueling out of your body, right? But it's based in matter, right? And then we have this second category that Agrippa calls celestial magic that we would call, as a modern person, probably call astrological magic, which is really rooted in time, right? So we have the magic of matter and the magic of time. And then we have this third category that Agrippa calls divine magic, which is sort of like the magic of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Things that are bound in neither space, matter, nor in time, right? Um, And that category, right, is the category. Magic in that category tends to rely partly on interaction with spirits, but in particular, because I would say all of the categories involve interaction with spirits, actually, right? But like what sets celestial magic apart is it's not bound in matter or in time. Like it's fundamental power is coming from like these magic words and names and formulas and geometry, right? It's a very sort of idea driven magic and the pentacles, right? Which, so the book isn't about, I mean, it's this on ramp to Solomonic magic, but it's very specifically about this particular kind of Solomonic magic called, that we usually call a pentacle or a Hebrew mm-hmm. seal. They're a kind of amulet with Hebrew writing on them and sometimes a little bit of geometry. Um, and I think that like the magic of them is in the language, right? It's in the, so, you know, I went, I went through a lot of choices for the L in SLM, right? So mm-hmm. at first it was right. language and then it was linguistics. And I think in the book I settled on logos, but sometimes if you listen yeah. to me in interviews, I say that it's linguistics. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's one of those and, and all of those words are related anyway, right? So I really think that like, you know, when I was coming up in Solomonic magic and even today, I'll be talking to other magicians, like asking questions of a teacher or talking to a colleague. And I'll, I'll be like, hey, on this pentacle, like, what does this name mean? And s- most of them will say, I don't know. Perfectly valid answer. But sometimes they'll say it doesn't matter. And like, I think it does matter. Like, I think <laughs> when your magic is made out of words, it probably does matter what those words are. Right. So most of the book, honestly, and you know, when I was coming up, 
I found it deeply frustrating that I couldn't get an answer to these questions. Like, what does this word mean? Which you wouldn't think would be like an earth shaking question, but I found it frustrating that like, I couldn't find a book that just explained, like just translated yeah. the words on the pentacles. So Zen, so Yoda. And, right. And so I just wrote one, <laughs> right? Like they have words on them. They're made out of these words and names. Right. Um, and I offer some ways to understand them. But we were talking before that, like, the nature of a magical text is that it can mean different things. So I'm in no way suggesting that, like, my reading of the Mathers Pentacles is the only correct one. But I do think, you know, the the Pentacles from the Key of Solomon are are like squarely inside this bigger Hebrew amulet tradition. Like they're very similar to other kinds of Hebrew amulets, right? And so, and that's not a dead kind of magic. Like there's a deep and rich living tradition of how they work. And in essence, how they work is by pairing a kevat, like a ritually, a ritual precision, right? Like you're doing things exactly in order the correct way. You are pairing that with kevana, the, this mystic intent, right? And so for me, like the real essence of working with pentacles or with Hebrew amulet magic more generally, right, is matching your mystic intent to like the exact letters that are on the pentacle, right? And in order to do that, I think you need to decide what those words mean, right? And in a lot of cases, they could mean a lot of things. And I give a couple options. Um, and in some of them, I didn't think they meant anything because I think they're spelled wrong. And so occasionally I correct them so awesome well for the audience i certainly highly recommend you read then get sarah's book the sorcery of solomon and uh, we'll have this on the show notes but where can people find more about you so the easiest way to find me is to either just put quotes around my name and put it into google mastros is a quite unusual name it's greek it used to be master be holly uh-huh. so like i'm gonna be like there aren't other sarah mastros let's go to come up as me but witchlessons.com, w-i-t-c-h lessons.com has links to all my books all my courses um for people who who want more of a community experience working through the book um i do have a companion course that goes with where you get to like learn a bunch of all the kinds of like personal detail-y type stuff that I did today in this interview. Like the course has a lot more of that, that kind of stuff that's not in the book and does all the technical stuff in the book. Um, And you can see my upcoming events. So uh, in late February, I will be at Convocation in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, And then in late March, I will be at Sacred Space in suburban Baltimore. Then I'm at Tradera uh idf wellspring in i think may and then in june i'm in birmingham england at the magical women's conference and then in july i am at a lunar witchcraft retreat in italy and then i will come home and never go anywhere ever again (laughs) busy witch (laughs) you know over covid i really missed like festivals and conventions so then when it came back i said yes to everything Uh, yeah and now that i look at my calendar i'm like oh what have i done like like, like, i'm I'm not 20 anymore and that like that's a lot of travel yeah i'm really a hobbit who like i mean (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm just a hobbit at heart. Like, I really mean it. Like, I just want to, like, have tea and sit under my tree and, like, (laughs) read my books. Like, that's my, that's me living my best life. (laughs) And that's a lot of travel and giant conventions full of people who want to talk to me. Uh, You'll you'll have great experience. Memorable times. I I do. I love, I know I'm not supposed to admit this as a cleric, but, like, I do like it when a whole room full of people claps and says my name. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I am actually an extrovert and I really missed it over over COVID, those big in-person gatherings. Like oh, I like this kind of one-on-one online stuff. But yeah, I love... and you're not being tied to a stake with torches. They're exactly. Actually, they're going, we love your book. <laughs> Yay. Hopefully. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it ain't over till it's over <laughs> the way this country's going. <laughs> awesome. Well. First, Vance, thanks for uh, keeping us company. Oh, sure. It's uh, been delightful, informative, and uh, say hi to Solomon for me, Sarah. Will do, but you could also say hi to him yourself. He's very accessible. Very. I don't have his number, though. (laughs) Oh, here's the thing. You actually do. It's a name-based magic. His name is Solomon. Yes. Or you can do it. Hey, Solomon. What's the yeah. name, what's the famous song? Eight six seven five three zero oh, nine. I can't believe I still remember that. <laughs> remember that song? Yes. Uh-huh. Eight six seven five three zero oh, nine. That's yeah. it. That's yep. It. 
Yeah, I don't I don't want to call that number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Millions have already. Well, awesome. Well, Sarah, we really enjoyed your company. Good luck with your work. Thanks for what you're doing, Anya. We look forward to hopefully having you back on the show again. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. You had great questions. Sometimes I do these interviews and it's like the same five questions over and over, but this is a really fun one. Oh, I hear you. I hear you. If I go to another podcast and somebody goes, what is Gnosticism? I'm like, uh, I've done this like 10,000 times. I realize <laughs> now like that I, you know, I listen to myself on YouTube when all these podcasts and I realize that I'm basically on a script. Like there are certain <laughs> questions and I feel bad. Like I'm not doing it on purpose. But, but it's like, the same question. Yeah, there's so. only so many ways to answer a question. <laughs> and I realize that I'm like, so somebody I know is going to like take, cut all of them from these YouTube and like play them right in a row. And I'm going to seem like an idiot <laughs> playing the same thing over and over. But I'm trying <laughs> <laughs> we do what we can well thank you sarah that was a lot of fun thank you yeah it's fun as well and there you have it sarah giving us the wisdom and magic of solomon all to get us out of this 1984 shit show in our second part sarah will discuss dream magic and more on ancient jewish magic She'll disclose the notion of Logos magic and how to craft your own grimoire. Sarah will also discuss what it takes to be a good and effective magician or witch and share what is the most impressive magical feat she ever performed. And it's one of the wildest stories I've ever heard. So please become a member for the full Solomon Temple. It's only $6.99 for AB Prime, or $4.99 at Red Circle, or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon a month. You'll get access to my private Facebook group and Discord channel for AB Prime members and higher level Patreons. If you find value in this content, please help grow this Red Pill Cafeteria. Your help can be in the form of a one-time donation on Stripe, or the US Mail, or even crypto. There is also a link on the show notes if you want to leave a tip or you can tip on any YouTube show. There's always the merch store and an Amazon wish list. And don't forget the new Gnostic Tarot that is selling very well. And consider the Finding Hermes program, where we have monthly exclusive meetings and presentations, with many past guests hanging out there for some high-octane nooses. If you need any help with these choices, just message my ass. I'm always here to help, and I truly appreciate your help. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always.